And so let that start. All right. So officially, you know, welcome to um, today's presentation. It's Riverside Nature Center monthly med talk. Um, and um, we are get into that. Let's go over just a couple um, uh, housekeeping uh, administrative things. As I keep mentioning, um, if you don't already have your microphone muted, please do so now. Um, we will uh, take care of unmuting everybody uh, later and uh, at towards the end of the, the conversation, um, which gets me to if you have any questions, um, there is a chat button down at the oh, bottom of the screen. Stuck. And so if I could have people please uh, make sure that they are muted, um, that would be helpful. And so anyway, so hold your questions until the end, if you will, please. And um, if you want to, just for a mental note, use the chat down at the bottom, click on that, you can type in your question and uh, I'll be able to see that uh, at the end of the um, conclusion of the presentation. Um, at that time, we're going to open up mics and we'll open up videos and everything so that it's a little more personal in, in our question and answer um, session. So, today at talk, um, we're going to go on a photo journey uh, of Big Bend National Park. And our guide today is going to be uh, Max Trayway. Max is a born and raised Texan. So, you know, yay! <laughs> he, um, after receiving his degree in wildlife science at A&M, he began his 38 year career with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Max retired as the district leader of the Edwards Plateau Wildlife District, which covers 25 counties. Since his retirement, Max has made 40 trips to uh, Big Bend National Park and has utilized all the available lodging and camping options, uh, which also included some designated backcountry and primitive roadside camps. Uh, Max's camping and day trip adventures extend to several of the state parks uh, where he's always on the prowl for uh, critters and plants to observe and photograph. So I think we have a wonderful guide with us today and I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to turn this over to um, Max and all right, Max, you just need to share your screen and we'll be up and running. Okay. Thank you, Becky. You're very welcome. All right. Well, as Becky mentioned, this is going to cover Big Bend National Park. I don't know if everybody who's online has been out there before, but it's just well worth the, the drive, if you ask me. It's my favorite park by far. I just like the wide open spaces and all the different animals and such. So we're going to cover a, a selective topic says a sampling of the plants and animals and some scenery shots. So. Let's get started. Um, here's a map. And uh, basically, um, uh, the way I get to Big Bend, I go down Interstate 10, Fort Stockton, come in on 385, which comes through Marathon, leave Interstate 10 at Fort Stockton and come down Marathon and on into the park on 385. You can also come in from Alpine at, on 118 over on the left side here. So it's, um, there's approximately 801,000 acres in the park. And it's got a pretty good diversity of different habitats. It's got about 118 miles of Rio Grande River frontage on the south here. And of course, across the river um, is Mexico. Um, so it's a big park. And there's lots of, lots of different habitats to, uh, to get lost in. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's, of course, it's got the Chisos Mountains pretty much right in the center here. And um, uh, 
the highest point in the park is called Emory Peak, which is a, a little over 7,000 feet. So in the, in the basin right here is within the mountains, and it's a little over 5,000 feet. So when you leave the desert down here and uh, drive up into the basin, you usually lose about 10 degrees in temperature. Uh, there's quite a difference between, the, of course, the desert and the basin temperature. So again, quite a variety um, in the mountains right here. And, and most, of it, most of it is desert uh, with a few other low hills. Um, so big place. All right, this is what the basin looks like. And these are the only overnight accommodations other than camping or RV that are available within the park. This is right in the middle of the basin. And they've got some motel type rooms. Um, they've got a uh, visitor center, ranger station, small grocery store. And then there's a restaurant over here. You can't see for the, uh, you might be able to see it, but I've got my screen blocked with this uh, little side window here. But anyway, there's a restaurant and the lodging check-in over here to the right of the screen. And this is looking from one of the trails going up to what they call the South Rim, which is one of the more popular trails in the um, basin area. This is the campground within the basin. There's three developed campgrounds. The one in the basin, then there's one on the west side called Cottonwood. And then there's another one on the east side called Rio Grande Village. Now, none of, none of these developed sites campgrounds have uh, hookups. The only hookups are available at Rio Grande Village in basically a parking lot in front of the store. I think there's like 30, 25 or 30 slots that you can pull an RV or a pretty good sized trailer and they're all parallel to each other and they have full hookups. But, um, and then of course they've got, you can backpack into the Chisos you can do zone camping within the desert. And then they've got a number of roadside campsites that are basically just a cleared area along some of the roads where you can set up a tent and park your vehicle. So several options as far as uh, how you stay overnight, but the only overnight commercial accommodations are at the basin. So here's another shot. This is from actually from the top of Emory Peak, looking down into the basin. And you can see, again, on my screen, let me see if I can, there you go. Um, this is the, uh, the um, facilities at the basin that I had on the screen just a minute ago. Here's a restaurant over here. And here's a campground in the background. Um, and the window, which is a uh, popular viewing point is to the left here. So I'm up on top of Emory Peak looking down, and you can see a trail here. I think that's probably Laguna Meadow Trail. There's two main trails to get up into the Chisos, Laguna Meadow and the Pinnacles. This picture was taken from the desert, and you can see the low clouds. This, these are the Chisos Mountains right here that you can see shortly after you get into the park. You've got to drive a little ways because it's another 30 miles or so from the, uh, from the north entrance, the way I come in, to the headquarters. You can just see some white spots here in the distance. That's the park headquarters at what they call Panther Junction. That's where Highway 385 meets a road that goes east and west through the park. <clears throat> Here's another, um, Pretty good marker here within the park. These are called Mule, Mule Ears Peaks. And you can see how they get their name. Look like a couple of Mule Ears. And you can see them real well from, uh, from what they call Ross Maxwell Drive, which uh, goes through part of the park on down to the river. And they're, they make a good landmark. Mule Ears Peaks. This is Santa Elena Canyon. 
and you're looking through or what was a window at one time at a ruin uh, in Terlingua Abajo, one of the old communities where there are several ruins there. And so this is Santa Elena Canyon, uh, which you can float through with commercial guides. This is looking into the canyon. The water's coming at you here. And there is a trail. If it, it hasn't rained a bunch, you've got to cross a little creek on the right over here. And sometimes that gets full of water or too muddy to where you can't get through it. But if you can get through the trail, you can go up and around over here and come down into just barely into the canyon. But uh, I've never made the uh, the rafting tour through it, but it's, it, I think it's a pretty popular uh, activity. This is called Balance Rock. This is in the Grapevine Hills, which are located just north of Panther Junction. And it's an easy hike, about two miles into, you can walk right up to and actually go through or under the Balance Rock if you're brave enough to not worry about it falling on you, but uh, it's, it's a nice hike. <clears throat> this is uh, a shot from the Boot Canyon Trail. And you can see where the canyon gets its name. It's a rock formation there in the canyon. This is a kind of a uh, off, the, off the grid site. It's called Cattail Falls. And this is what it normally looks like in a, in a normal dry period. Now I'm gonna see if my video works. I don't know if the sound will come through, but this is what it looks like in a, in a wet period during what they call the monsoon. So this is Cattail Falls running pretty good. It's on the uh, south side of the Chisos Basin. This is another, what they call pour, pour off, P-O-U-R-O-F-F. -F. <clears throat> it's just a spot where like a creek or some low area drains off of a higher, higher area. And this one is called Pine Canyon pour off. Let's see if it runs. Again, this is during a wet period. Normally it would be dry and maybe just a trickle coming off the top. It's also, it's about a two mile, pretty easy hike into right here at the, uh, at the pour off. Okay, let's look at a, uh, being pretty much a flat country, desert type country with mostly low brush, you get a lot of nice shots of the horizon and um, you get the right clouds, you can see some beautiful sunrise, sunsets and such. This is a sunrise looking east and you can see some Ocotillo plants kind of framing it. And these are the Chisos Mountains in the background. Here's the same shot about 15 minutes later, with the sun just fixing to peak up over the mountains. And um, right across into Mexico, <clears throat> you get into the mountains of Mexico, and it's pretty common to have thunderstorms build in the afternoon over in Mexico. Normally, uh, I don't know that I've ever had one actually make it over into Big Bend while I was there, but but they, they make for some pretty cloudscapes from, uh, from the park. Okay, now let's get into some animals and plants. According to Tom Vandenberg, who's chief of interpretation at Big Bend National Park, Big Bend has more species of birds, reptiles, cactus, butterflies, ants, scorpions than any other national park, plus they have more species of bats than any other national park. So they're pretty prolific with their animal and, and plant species. About 450 bird species, 75 mammal species, 67 amphibian and reptile, 
and about 1,200 species of plants. So a good wide variety. Um, we'll hit a few big, bigger, uh, bigger animals here. These are white-tailed deer. They don't look exactly like the ones we have around Kerrville. These are, <clears throat> these are called Corman Mountain white-tailed deer. They're very common in the, in the uh, Chisos Mountains. These were actually taken, this picture was taken at the Basin Campground. <clears throat> and you see they're still in velvet. But there, you see them pretty regularly there in the, in the Basin. The other species of deer in the park is a desert mule deer. And you can see they've got a little bit different tail, black uh, tip to it, white, and then the, the big ears from which they get their name mule deer. And their antler formation is a little bit different also. They mainly occur in the desert and in the um, foothills along the Jesus Basin, along the Jesus Mountains. Avelina are very common. Being a desert, they're real common in the basin and uh, just uh, throughout the park. They do have a breeding population of Mexican black bear that is reestablished in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Uh, but they do see cubs. Uh, this bear was actually in the parking lot of the, uh, uh, of the basin uh, lodge area. And there are some cottages off to the right here. And I happened to catch him coming through that parking lot. And here's another shot of him. And got a few pictures before he headed off into the brush. Uh, they do have mountain lion on the park. Uh, they're not very often seen, as you would expect. Very secretive species. I actually took this picture at Arizona Sonora Desert Museum in, uh, out of Tucson, Arizona. I've never seen one on the park, but I have seen their sign. They have a good many coyotes. Um, this one was feeding on a roadkill just off the road down to Rio Grande Village one day when my wife and I were he headed down that way. And I think it looked like a female to me, and I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that she may have some pups Back, uh, back at her den somewhere, because she was awfully gaunt. Um, so she might have been feeding some pups. I've seen a number of bobcat. This one was actually behind the store at Rio Grande Village. Um, but they they occur throughout the, the park. A number of rabbits. This is a uh, black-tailed jackrabbit, which are more common in the desert area. And of course, you can see he's got his air conditioned airs going. They um, use these big ears, big thin, thin ears to uh, uh, dissipate heat. There's a lot of blood vessels in those ears. So uh, he's trying to stay cool as best as possible. Desert cottontail, another rabbit species. Digging a farm, they'll probably lay down in that farm uh, in that cooler dirt to try to stay cool. There are a couple of species of kangaroo rat. I'm not sure which one this one is. It's either Ords or Miriams. Uh, but they're a nocturnal species. You'll see them crossing the road, mainly in loose soil areas, sandy areas and such. <clears throat> this is a Texas antelope squirrel. It's a little ground squirrel, smaller than our rock squirrel and tree squirrels. And they frequent rocky areas. Um, they're a neat little squirrel. I don't think he was too happy with me being in his territory. Okay, let's look at a few birds. Uh, Mexican jays are very common in the mountains and they're in the basin. And this, I took this picture uh, at Boot Spring, and apparently somebody has been doing some research on him. You can see this bird has some bands on him. Um, 
I don't, I'm not sure what the project involved, but this was right at Boot Spring. They're very noisy species, just like most jays are. Acorn woodpecker, very common. Another noisy species of the mountains, uh, very colorful species. And they uh, collect acorns and they will bang a hole in a dead tree or limb there and they'll store their acorn, acorns in those holes for, for future use. So if you find an old dead snag somewhere that's got a bunch of, <clears throat> a bunch of holes in it, in, in the uh, basin there, probably a result of these acorn woodpeckers storing their acorns for, for wintertime use. The main species of quail in the park is the scale quail. And you can see where it gets the name, scale quail. The feathers look a lot like scales on a fish. They also go by the common name of cotton top, cotton top quail, because of the white feathers on the top of the head. Also called blue quail. So, <clears throat> no Bob Whites in, in Big Ben, it's all pretty much desert. Of course, we can't talk about the desert without bringing up the Roadrunner. They're pretty common in the desert areas. You see them a lot on the trails. And of course, there's a lot of reptiles being in desert, which is one of their main, main prey species. Another bird species that uh, you'd have to go to a desert somewhere to, to probably to find is a crystal thrasher. Um, and this was, I think I took this, on one of the basin trails, um, but they're pretty distinctive, pretty easy to, to distinguish from some of the other thrashers. This is a gray hawk. There's been a pair that has been nesting at Cottonwood Campground, which is right on, on the river, on the west side of the park. Been nesting there for a number of years. I don't know if they're still using uh, that area or not. But uh, luckily they were there one year when a buddy of mine and I were there. So a common gray hawk. And one day that same buddy of mine and I, we were walking the chimney trail and I happened to be in the lead and noticed something black off to the side of the trail <clears throat> a little ways up uh, up ahead. And first I thought it was javelinas, but got a little closer and realized it was uh, common ravens and got even closer and saw what they were doing. They were standing around waiting for this peregrine falcon to finish his meal of blue winged teal that he apparently had knocked out of the air right before we arrived at, at the site. So they were, the ravens were hoping to uh, take home some scraps, I'm sure. They do have peregrines that nest in the cliffs, uh, in the Chisos Mountains, and they will actually close part of what they call the rim trail during the spring and early summer to keep from um, impacting these peregrine nests. So uh, you gotta keep that in mind if you've got plans to hike the full rim trail during the spring and summer, they, they will probably have part of the trail closed. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to some creepy crawler types. This is a lesser earless lizard. And the reason he's on his uh, standing like he is, is that cement is pretty hot. It was a pretty warm day. And I had my wife take the picture out of the passenger side of our vehicle. Uh, because when we drove up there, he was up on his legs like that, trying to, I guess, keep his belly from getting too hot. So, um, but, uh, but then I did find one sometime later in a little bit more, uh, distinguished pose than, than that previous one. This, this is the same type of lizard, lesser earless lizard. 
This is a Texas alligator lizard. They occur in the Tissos Mountains. I actually took this picture here in the hill country, but it's the same species. Looks a lot like an alligator. This one is called side, a common side blotch lizard. And you can see the spot on its side. That's where it gets the name. Occur mainly in the desert areas. This is a long-nosed leopard lizard. Again, more of a desert species. Um, and being, again, being a desert, mostly warm during the year, you have a good many reptiles uh, that occur here. Eastern collared lizard, big head and all, and you can see where he gets his name from the collar. One of the nocturnal lizards, there are several gecko that occur there. This is a Texas banded gecko. And you see he's lost his tail. I don't know, I'm not sure what happened to it, but he should grow back part of that tail at least. Um, I've not seen the other species, the reticulated gecko yet, but I hope to make more trips, more trips in the future. They have a couple of, uh, of uh, horned lizards that occur in the desert. This is the large round-tailed horned lizard. It occurs in the desert area, mostly in, uh, mainly in sandy type soils. You see them uh, driving when you're driving some of the back roads. I ran across this box turtle on my way out of the park one day during uh, one of the wet period. I was hoping to try to make it a desert box turtle, but once I got home and did some more research, I'm pretty sure it's the more common ornate box turtle, which we should have here in, in our area. Um, but I was a little bit surprised to find it along the uh, pavement just north of, of the park. Sonoran gopher snake, also known as bull snake. This is a pretty good, pretty good size specimen here. Um, and we do have, of course, bull, what we call bull snakes here in the hill country. But I think the official common name now has been changed to Sonoran gopher snake. Central Texas whip snake. It's the same species that we have here in the hill country. I've seen several of them here around Kerrville. A very, uh, a very fast snake. Texas liar snake. This was actually taken uh, within the parking area at the basin campground. They're more, mainly a nocturnal snake, but we caught this one out during the day and just got some pictures. And it's named, it's got a um, diagram, looked kind of like a liar, uh, L-Y-R-E, I believe is the spelling. Uh, and they have elliptical pupils, vertical pupils. Um, and I don't think they're very common, mainly in the, within the basin area. This is another nocturnal snake, Texas night snake. He's also got the elliptical pupils. This is called a ring, um, it's a ring neck snake. I've not seen one with a ring around it yet. It's the regal ring neck snake, but it's close kin to the little ring neck we have around here that's usually got a red or orange or possibly yellow ring around the neck. I've seen several of them on the river trail, but this one does have the colorful underbelly. You can't see it in this picture, but it does have a nice bright belly, but no ring there. I've seen several of these at Big Bend. 
this is a patch nose snake. There's two different species. I think this is the big bin patch nose snake. Got kind of a patch over the nose, hence the name. This snake um, is, um, I think, watch the next three slides. I think they're all the same species. And if I'm correct in identifying them, they've got a really good uh, apical um, common name. They go by the variable ground snake. They're small, pretty small snake. So this one and this one with the bands and this one also with the bands, but more color between the bands. And this one almost solid. I believe that all four pictures are of the same species, the variable ground snake. If you look closely at this one, you can spot a few very faint bands on the body here. So I think they're all probably the same species, the small, the small variable ground species, ground snake. This is a Transpacus rat snake. The head's up here and he's uh, going through the brush here. We got a real interesting pattern, kind of a ladder type pattern along the back. All right, you can you can pretty well if you're gonna see any snakes at Big Ben, this is one of the more common ones. So uh, if you're lucky to see one, you can always tell people that claim they saw a pink elephant somewhere. You can tell them, well that's not, nothing I saw a pink snake at Big Ben, but this is a, a pretty much normal coloration for the Western coach whip, which is what this is. It's the same coach whip that we have in the hill country that just get a little bit more pink or reddish out in the Western part of the state. Another very fast snake, very difficult to get a good picture of them, always moving usually. Okay, um, I'm sure everybody's heard of crop, crop circles. Those circles in a uh, cornfield or some other kind of crop that nobody's been able to explain that I'm aware of uh, out in fields somewhere. You run across this type of circle. I've seen several of them at Big Bend and I like to call them crap circles, <clears throat> C-R-A-P. Uh, and let me show you why. One morning, I was hiking uh, towards Dobson, the old Dobson Ranch site, uh, which is on the eastern side of the of the uh, Chisos Mountains in the desert, and walked walking along this trail here, and was fixing to go around this clump of weeds here and look down. And look what I saw right on the trail nearly. Western Diamondback rattlesnake coiled up. It was pretty cool, so I don't know if he had a, been very active or not if I had stepped right by him, but luckily I spotted him. So you need to be on your, on your toes when you're walking in Big Bend. I walked on past him, went around him, and then took a picture going back. And here's a trail I was coming down. And here's a clump I was fixing to walk around. And here's a snake right here. You can pick him out right at the edge of the trail. Here's another Western Diamondback. This one is not quite as uh, docile as the other one was. He's a little bit ready for action. I was fixing to leave one of my campsites when I spotted him and I think he was giving me a waving goodbye to me. This is another species of rattlesnake. You normally find these in the basin or the mountain areas. 
This is the black-tailed rattlesnake. Uh, this was on the northeast rim at about 7,000 feet. Um, so, and uh, I've heard people, and apparently they occur in the basin itself, but I don't think they're very common in the, in the desert. This is the other species of rattlesnake, mottled rock rattlesnake. It's somewhat smaller than the previous two. And it occurs anywhere you got, you have a lot of rocks. Hence its name, rock rattlesnake. Good many tarantulas in the park. Of course, during certain times of year, they're a little more active. The same tarantula we have here in the hill country, Texas brown tarantula. <clears throat> this scorpion is somewhat larger than the one we have. I believe this is the Big Ben scorpion. That's the common name. It's like I say, it's a, it's a couple inches in size. <clears throat> but from what I read about him, the stinger doesn't pack a whole lot of uh, potency from that end, but these large claws on the other end are strong enough to break to break the skin. So if even if it doesn't get you with the front, you've got to be careful. I mean with the with the back, you've got to be careful with the front. The giant vinegaroon or whip scorpion, they're fairly common in the uh, they're in the basin area. And they're pretty much harmless. They do eject a a uh, a um, I don't know if it's a liquid or a mist from the tail end here that, that has a very vinegar-like smell, hence their name. This is a sopagid, also known as a wind scorpion or sun spider. Uh, they have no venom, but their jaws apparently will give you a pretty good bite if you miss mishandle them. They're not very big, but they're very fast. I've seen a couple of them while I was messing around on my campground doing this and that and having them go running by me real fast. <clears throat> this interesting little critter looked like a little bowl of cotton or a little um, uh, ball of cotton blowing around in the in the dirt. It's actually a velvet ant. It's a female wasp. This one is called a, a thistle down velvet ant. And it's a, it's a very active species. Uh, that's why I say it's, um, it looks like cotton, a little ball of cotton blowing around. They're not real big, but being a velvet ant, they do have a sting and they're, uh, they're, fl they're flightless. The males do fly, but not the females. Okay, we're gonna um, move on into plants now. And here's a picture of a uh, scarlet bovardia with a hawk moth uh, or sphinx moth feeding on it. So it makes a good um, move going from insects into plants. This cactus is well named. It's called a rainbow cactus. And you can see where it gets its name from the different colors on the, um, on the pads here. Uh, rainbow cactus, very, very pretty blooms. And to me, the uh, unopened blooms look a lot like a candle with a flame on it. This pretty little cactus, I believe, is Warnock's cactus. It's named for a well-known, esteemed Sulros uh, Ross professor by the name of Benton Warnock. And there are a number of plants in, uh, out in the Big Bend area that uh, have his name. He was a well-known botanist from that area. This is a brown flowered 
cactus or let's see there is another name rusty hedgehog cactus and this is as big as the flowers get they don't open fully this one's got a beautiful flower and it's a big flower um, and it goes by the appropriate common name um, glory of texas and I just lucked out and found one of these in, in full bloom in the desert there. Cane Choya in bloom, very pretty plant. This is very interesting. This is actually a cactus, a thornless cactus. Um, It goes by the common name living rock cactus. And I've never seen the blooms, but apparently, apparently it puts on some uh, small pink blooms when it is um, in bloom. And unfortunately, they're kind of in demand now. And there's, uh, there are people that are going around digging these things up. So uh, if you see anybody look like they're doing, out, doing that, if you ever make it out to Big Ben, Please, please report them, because we need to make put a stop to that. <clears throat> We'd like them to be around for everybody to enjoy for years. Living rock cactus. If you've ever been hiking in the desert out there and been stabbed by uh, one of these lechuguilla stalks, then you know how painful they can be. They have a basal rosette of very stiff leaves with sharp spines on the end. But they do have a really nice bloom at, a, on the, at the end of a long stalk. So this is the lechuguilla in bloom. Ocotilla, you can see the thorns also something you need to be careful of when you're hiking around in the desert. But again, they also have a really nice bloom on them. Lechuguilla, and these are the plant, I mean, uh, Ocotillo. These are the plants that somebody, some folks will harvest and make fences out of them and actually plant them in the ground and have a living fence of Ocotillo. This is called long petal Echeveria. I've seen a couple of them in the basin area. Uh, this one, I believe, I photographed on the, uh, somewhere on the, on the uh, Laguna Meadow Trail. This is a really pretty plant. Um, it's actually an orchid. It's called Scarlet Ladies' Tresses. This is the plant on the left, and here's a close-up of the inflorescence. Very pretty plant. This was on the Boot Canyon Trail, uh, probably at about 6,000 feet or so. This pretty little plant is uh, called soft twine vine. It's a, it's a type of sarcostema, which is the genus name. It's got a beautiful Beautiful inflorescence. And this desert plant is, I think the more common name is bladder sage, but I prefer the, the other common name, which is paper bag bush. And the um, covering to the seeds, I believe, I don't know, they're, I don't, I'm not sure if they're sepals or petals, but they form this covering that, that, that looks similar to a paper bag. So that's how they get that, one of their common names. This is resurrection plant. And uh, normally, of course, it's being a desert, uh, it's fairly dry out that way. 
And most of the time when you find it, it'll be kind of shriveled up, look like it's on, the, on its way out, uh, about to die, or it might even look worse than this, and you might think it's dead. But give it a little moisture and it uh, will transfix into a, a nice green plant like this. And that's where it gets the name resurrection plant. This is a, uh, uh, one day I was hiking just before sunrise and caught the moon on its way down in the, on the western horizon. And of course this is with my telephoto, so blown up a little bit, but I thought it made a nice desert skyscape. So we open with a few sunrise shots. So I'm gonna close with um, a couple of sunsets. And like I say, with it being open like it is in the desert and not many trees to obstruct your view, you have a lot of opportunities to get some really nice skyscapes, either early morning or late afternoon, or like I showed earlier, possibly some thunderstorm shots. This shot is through the window in the, in the basin. And you can actually, if you're staying there at the basin, at the campground or at the lodge, which is back in this area here, they have a, a paved walkway that goes out to an overlook where you can sit there on benches and whatever and wait for the sunset. And hopefully you get some nice clouds in the west, you'll see a, a nice sun, sunset without going to too much effort to get to your viewing site. Here's another shot through the window. I believe I was somewhere along the window trail when I took this picture. Uh, uh, century plant, uh, silhouetted here on the left. Okay, I showed you a few animal species that you want to be aware of if you do any hiking at all at Big Bend. Uh, scorpions, uh, tarantula, of course, aren't very dangerous, but might scare some people, but a number of snake species that are venomous. So you need to be on your toes when you're in Big Bend. Of course, you got all the thorns associated with the desert plants. But one of the most dangerous aspects of the park is heat. I took this picture, was under my shade canopy. It was about a quarter till five in April, on April the 6th. So 108 degrees is what my little uh, weather radio was showing. So you need to really be aware of that if you visit Big Bend during the during the hot months, because it does get extremely hot in the uh, desert. And it's not uncommon for people to be lost to heat stroke who don't come prepared, don't bring enough water, try to do their hiking during the heat of the day. Uh, the way I do it is I only go out first thing in the morning, then I'll hang around under my, um, hang around under my shade canopy during midday when it during the heat of the day and then i'll wait till about an hour before sunset and take off again just looking for critters and plants and whatever and then get back usually sometime after dark come back with my headlamps looking for nighttime critters but i avoid the heat as much as possible when i'm out stomping around All right, well, I actually made it through in better time than I thought I would. So those are all of the slides and uh, pictures that I have to show. And I think look like we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to close this out and see if I can get Becky back. Well, I mean, that's quite 
quite the um, experience. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Max. I no mean, I, I, you know, I, oh, I'm embarrassed to say this and admit it to this group of people. Um, I, you might stone me. I don't know. I have not had the opportunity to get out to Big Ben yet. And so, you know, <laughs> I can see Teresa and everybody going, it's far same. I mean, yeah, that's embarrassing. So Max, I mean, this, this is just more reason, more reason that, you know, I've got to uh, make the time and, and, and experience. Experience is beautiful and gorgeous. I mean, your, your pictures are just absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I'm going to shut up because this is not my time. Um, questions. Let's go ahead and um, let's see here. We've got people in our chat um, that have, you know, uh, thanked you, um, Max, for, you know, sharing your beautiful photos and uh, that brought back for uh, Patty uh, some great childhood memories. So, you know, that's, that's fantastic um, that, that that's happened. Um, but so, yeah, let's, let's just go ahead and, and um, I think that I might be able to unmute everybody. Um, maybe not. I know I can mute everybody. So, so no, yeah, I don't see where I can unmute everybody. So if you have a question, you know, unmute yourself and um, fire away. No, no questions. Well, okay. I have a question. Oh. I sent it in the chat, but maybe oh. you missed it. Um, Mr. Max, what's your favorite memory from all of your trips to the park? Oh, great. Oh, man, that's, that's a hard one. Uh, I Actually, I'm a big reptile enthusiast. So I uh, pretty much uh, rate my trips out there by the number of snakes that I run across. So a <laughs> five or six or more snake trip really stands out for me. But uh, um, I think running across those peregrine, that peregrine falcon on that uh, chimney's trail, which is going, which goes through the desert. You know, you wouldn't expect to find a peregrine falcon out in the desert away from water. Uh, but that was, that was, very memorable in, in um, to my thinking, and I know I'll carry that one with me for a good while. But um, I've never had a bad experience out there, and I'm always looking forward to, to my next trip. Thank you, sir. Yes, yes, ma'am. So how hard was it, Max, to um, you know, narrow down? I'm sure you've got an inventory of photos. <laughs> <laughs> to, to just present in this short mere period of time. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure exactly how many I've got, but I did have to narrow down a bunch and actually thought that I would probably run out of time with what I had. So it worked out better than I was, was expecting, but I, I pretty well covered all the, the main animal species. I've got a lot more plant, spe uh, plant pictures, but uh, uh, I think most of the animals and Reptiles are, are pretty well covered. I have a question. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, when is a really good time of year in your estimation to go there? Ah, good question. It kind of depends on what you want to see. If you're like me and you uh, enjoy seeing the uh, snakes, lizards, and other things that like the warm months, then spring or summer, if you can handle the heat, or, or late fall. Of course, that's the uh, spring and fall uh, are some of the more popular times as far as other visitors, people. But they do get a lot of, I think they're probably their most, um, their busiest time is during the winter. A lot of people go out there during the winter, uh, just for the, mainly for the scenery. And of course, uh, they're, the wildlife here, mammal species and what have you. But I prefer the warm months myself. And I have been out there during June and August. Wow. Some of the peak heat times. But again, 
I just stay under my shade canopy, uh, shade canopy during the hottest part of the day and look forward to getting out when it cools down a little bit and see what other kind of critters are stirring after dark or just before dark. <clears throat> so it depends on what you're uh, looking for, but um, Big Ben has become more popular since I first started going out there in 2007. So it's, um, you need to make sure you call ahead if you're wanting to stay in the lodge, which has some really, you know, really nice rooms. They've got a nice restaurant there, so you can eat there. And um, they've got some, some old stone cottages that were built by the uh, CCC that you can rent also. So there's several options to stay there within the basin. But um, when you go, it's pretty much a matter of, of what you're hoping to see. If you've never been, then as far as I'm concerned, any time would be a good time okay. to get out there. There are, there's, uh, you can get around uh, on several paved roads and see a good bit of the scenery. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Questions, anybody? No. Well, Max, um, I can't thank you enough uh, for Riverside Nature Center and, and all our viewers today for joining us and, and taking us on this journey. Um, so, you know, put you on the spot. I mean, we might have to, you know, take another trip to one of the other national or state parks um, with you as a guide. How about it? You take it. me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to quite a few of them and I've got a lot of pictures, but <laughs> okay. that'll be for another time. Good, good. Well, thank you, my friend, and thank you all for um, joining us today. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, stay tuned next month. Um, I, I don't have a specific date yet, but uh, tentatively, uh, September 22nd, we're going to have Dr. Chris Distel uh, join us, and he's going to be talking about. I think this is fascinating. Um, it's China berry trees and mm. the, um, their, their toxicity and the impact they have on aquatic insects. So that, that should be very interesting. Um, and yeah, just go to riversidenaturecenter.org, check out our calendar um, and see what we've got on the horizon as far as, you know, scintillating adult education. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you one and all. I'm going to end this meeting and uh, appreciate it. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for showing up. Bye. Ready? Fire. I have a question for you, Riverside. Are you? Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, you're still there? Okay. Um, I, I was having internet issues at home and I didn't log in until very late. So can I watch this? Is it, I, I see that it's being recorded. How do I go about? Uh, you know, I thank you for saying that. And, and that was, you know, a big mistake on my part, but I should have let everybody know that, yeah, it is being recorded. Um, once Zoom processes it, it usually takes about 24 hours um, okay. and we'll have it posted on our website. Um, okay. Under, uh, it, uh, at the top of the menu, it'll say learn with us and we have a video library. So okay. um, it will be posted um, there. And usually what I do is I send out a, uh, an email to the participants of the uh, webinars, letting them know that. Okay, great, thank you. You're very welcome. Bye-bye, mm -hmm. I enjoyed what I saw and I'm looking forward to catching the rest of it. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> so Max, I was just gonna, I was usually just shut this off, but I was hanging on um, so yeah, you and I okay. could- I've got a question, Becky. Sure. Uh, during the presentation, were you able to see that mouse that I was moving around? Yeah. Okay. 
I didn't know if it was <laughs> visible to everybody or not. It's okay, but yeah, you had a bright pink mouse running yeah. around. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's all okay. right, all right, all right. Um, yeah, I'm Max. I, I, um, we've got some people just kind of you know hanging out with us. I'm, I'm gonna um give you a call. So I'm gonna close this out and I'll give you a call. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye. Okay.